You're watching Reality Check. Around the world, governments and enterprises are taking note of the Pegasus project, a collaborative journalism project that seeks to shine a light on the potential misuse of a highly invasive spyware, Pegasus, manufactured by the Israel-based NSO Group, and which may have been used to target scores of journalists, politicians and public figures from India and around the world. In France, government prosecutors today said they've opened up a probe into the alleged spying of journalists via Pegasus. Amazon put out a statement saying Amazon Web Services, its subsidiary that provides cloud computing services, has shut down infrastructure and accounts linked to the NSO group. But the Indian government, curiously, in its attempts to distance itself from the spying scandal, appears to be endorsing the NSO group's defense, in effect validating the clean chit NSO gave to itself. The Minister for IT, speaking in Parliament, quoted from statements and interviews of the NSO group, in which NSO has argued that the Pegasus media reports are without basis. NSO has also said that the list of countries shown using Pegasus is incorrect. <coughs> and many countries mentioned <coughs> are not even our clients. It also said that most of its clients are Western countries. <coughs> it is evident, Honorable Chairman Sir, Speaker Sir, that NSO has also clearly rubbished the claims in the report. Now let's leave aside the puzzling logic of why the Indian government would take at face value a defense offered by a foreign private entity. And instead ask, are the government's arguments borne out by the facts? NSO, based on its public statements, appears to have a history of giving itself clean chits whenever confronted with charges of the misuse of Pegasus. But as many have pointed out, those clean chits are riddled with contradictions. NSO has repeatedly claimed that its spyware is not for use against journalists and activists, and that it only sells its spyware to government entities for the purposes of fighting crime and terror. It also has at times claimed that it is able to monitor the end use of its product by its clients against potential misuse. In an interview in 2019, when asked about the murder of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi, who was reportedly spied upon using Pegasus, the head of NSO claimed that it conducts, in quotes, a thorough inspection of its clients, and it is impossible to act against a target such as Khashoggi without NSO being able to check it. In fact, publicly available Pegasus documentation submitted in a U.S. court in 2019, accessed by a University of Toronto research group, Citizen Lab, says NSO is responsible for training the end users and that the Pegasus spyware comes with a one-year maintenance support and upgrade contract. So, NSO should know to some extent about how Pegasus is used. But then, in what appears to be a contradiction, NSO has in its statement said again and again that we do not operate Pegasus technology, nor do we have any knowledge of the individuals whom states might be investigating. But this too is contracted by another set of contractual documents accessed by the Delhi-based legal website, the Leaflet. In those documents, the NSO makes it mandatory for the client government to produce evidence to support its request to buy and use Pegasus. These are some of the things that are required. A legitimate surveillance request should be supported by evidence. Details of suspected crimes should be submitted of the individual that is supposedly to be targeted. Surveillance duration and renewals need to be specified. A retention period needs to be specified. Approval has to be granted by an authorized independent oversight authority in accordance with local laws. So again, is the NSO group just supplying spyware without being aware of end use? Or is it actively playing a role in determining, along with governments, who gets spied on and who doesn't? Given these contradictions, all of which are in public domain, should the government of India be taking NSO's defense at face value? Instead, to further rubbish the Pegasus investigation, former IT minister Ravi Shankar Prasad yesterday referred to the earlier scandal of 2019 when it was reported that Pegasus had used WhatsApp to infect the phones of Indian targets, Mr. Prasad claiming that those charges too came to nothing. WhatsApp very specifically contended before the Supreme Court that its data cannot be hacked by the Pegasus of the Israeli system. WhatsApp, in fact, has sued the NSO group in a U.S. court for the 2019 breach, where it has argued that Pegasus indeed did compromise its systems. 
So the government claiming that WhatsApp has ruled out a Pegasus hack, WhatsApp in a US court, Pegasus has accessed our servers illegally. These are some of the statements WhatsApp made before the US court. Pegasus accessed and used our servers without authorization in an effort to compromise approximately 1,400 target devices. NSO reverse engineered the WhatsApp app in order to transmit malicious code to target devices over WhatsApp servers. Moreover, Will Cathcart, the CEO of WhatsApp, has put out a series of tweets following the latest set of Pegasus stories, where he's directly hit out at the NSO group, saying NSO's dangerous spyware is used to commit horrible human rights abuses all around the world, and it must be stopped. All right, joining me tonight uh, on Reality Check, I have with me uh, Phineas Ruckert, journalist of Forbidden Stories, the uh, entity that uh, put out uh, the list in collaboration with other media houses. We have Omar Ben Jacob, who's tech editor at Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper. Raghu Karnad, former bureau chief of The Wire, writer and journalist, is with us, as is P.K.D. Nambiar, political analyst, supports the BJP. Uh, Phineas, if I can just start with you. Because once again, when we reached out to NSO Group, uh, they put out a statement, which we'll put on screen, where they say that, look, this list has nothing to do with NSO. We don't know where it's come from. And in a sense, this is a defense that's also being recycled by governments like ours. Uh, what would you say to that? Firstly, if you could just tell us a little bit about how you access the list and also the work that, that your group does, Forbidden Stories. Sure, of course. Thank you. And thank you for that very um, informative analysis that you've just done. Um, so Forbidden Stories, first, is a network of investigative journalists. We're based in Paris. Uh, the mission of Forbidden Stories is to pursue the work of journalists who are threatened throughout the world. So we've worked with journalists in Mexico, in India, in Malta, in many different places to try to pers pursue their work when they are threatened. So that's Forbidden Stories. Um, with Amnesty International, uh, we had access to a large list of 50,000 uh, num phone numbers mm. that were selected as potential targets of surveillance um, in at least 10 countries around the world. Um, we, through, that, through an analysis of that list and through a number of forensic analysis, mm. analyses of phones that had been in infected, uh, we were able to show in a, in a, in a large way how, how ex extensive this, this spyware seems to be used in a number of countries around the world. Okay. So in India alone, we were able to verify the numbers of more than 40 journalists, everyone from journalists like Swati Chaturvedi and Rohini Singh, so who are contributors for The Wire, uh, to local journalists, uh, Jaspal Haran Singh in uh, Punjab. So okay. we, we uh, also performed, like I said, um, 67 in, in analysis, for forensic analyses of these of phones that appeared in this list. And 37 of those revealed at least traces of spiral infection. Sure. But Phineas, uh, to my question, though, as to where you managed to get this list from, and is it, in fact, a list of potential NSO Pegasus targets? Because as you just uh, probably heard as well, NSO is claiming that it's not. We believe that our reporting and our analysis of this data seems to indicate that these um, numbers were at least potential uh, potential targets of this spyware. And it's very important to note that this is not necessarily, uh, uh, appearance on this list does not necessarily in, imply that the phone was, was compromised or was even targeted. Okay. But at this stage, I, I assume that you're not uh, keen to disclose how you access this list. I'm afraid not. Okay. But you, but you stand by the fact that it is an NSO Pegasus list. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, contrary to NSO's denials. Uh, okay, uh, Omar Ben Jacob, uh, you know, obviously, Pegasus is uh, based, or NSO group based in Israel. I know that Haaretz has been reporting it. Um, what do you make of their denials so far, and, and does their own track record actually give credence to their argument, or does it actually raise questions? So first, I want to just kind of reiterate something that Phineas said. I think that the, the reporting here from Forbidden Stories is, in a sense, impeccable. I think they've done phenomenal work, and we know it because it actually confirms a lot of the stuff that Haaretz has kind of, you know, in bits and pieces reported over the years. Mm. So generally, I think NSO's denial comes from the fact that, you know, you know, it's almost kind of their classic M.O., but I also think it comes from the fact that there might be some merit to it. There's, there's a chance that they don't always know 
what's being done with their technology. But that's not the same thing as saying that these are not actually potential targets. Hmm. And we know, we know from different sources that there is within the Israeli kind of cyber, offensive cyber community, also people who are, you know, in a sense, learning new things these yeah. past weeks. So I think in that sense, it, th there is an element of plausible deniability in the way NSO conducts themselves, which you could say maybe they're doing purposefully or not. Right. But I'm not sure they're always in the loop about everything. And some of the targets, I don't think that they necessarily would be cool with, not for political or moral reasons. We have to remember, this is a tech company, yeah? These people want to go public. They want to be traded on NASDAQ. They don't necessarily want to be affiliated with this stuff. So I, for a second, don't think that they have some massive moral scruples that they're listening to. Hmm. But I do think that they have a financial interest. And, in, for example, you know, uh, listening into journalists that then, you know, maybe disappear, which has happened in the past, hmm. or providing some technology which may play a role in that, looks right. very bad. The optics of that are just terrible, no matter how you kind of look at it. Right. Given all of this, Raghu Karnad, uh, and as we just were pointing out in our introduction, given also NSO's own contradictory statements about whether they are actually able to control and, and monitor the end use, uh, is it somewhat unfortunate that the government has almost unthinkingly, unquestioningly rehearsed or repeated NSO's own defense? I think, uh, to me, it's quite mystifying, Srinivas, because uh, the only conceivable, the only prof the only response one would expect from a functionally professional government would be, yes, we will investigate. Mm. Now, the thing about this list and the obfuscation around it is that, yes, the exact nature of the list may be ambiguous, and it doesn't help that NSO and many of these governments are not providing any information to their citizens. Right. But the list pointed investigators to specific devices, and on those devices, Pegasus hacking was confirmed. Mm. So that is a perfectly clear indication of the broad nature of the list and what its use might be. So we know that prominent Indian citizens have been hacked. Right. They're as prominent as Prashant Kishore. This is not a matter of speculation. This is corroborated. This is an investigator, and that investigation has been, has been vetted by independent uh, forensics and also by the best international newspapers. Right. The idea that we would face that, we'd face that reality, and a government would not order an investigation. Hmm. I don't know. Well, it points you to certain conclusions that uh, that, that that you can't avoid, right. and uh, that that contradict what the government itself is saying about its own position in this, and its uh, and and who the culpability lies with. Okay. Um, Why would you not investigate right right I, at the outset? I guess. I guess that's the question, uh, Pikita Nambiar, which we've been asking from when the story broke. Uh, and now you actually have other governments. France has opened up an investigation into these charges. Uh, we've seen entities like Amazon act on the basis of the information that's come out. Why is our government so reluctant to order a probe and instead is actually repeating NSO's clean shit to itself as though it's the gospel truth? Baffling. Uh, Srinivasan, my uh, two, three points. One is that if a, every individual, if there is any tapping is taking place and any no government has no business to intrude into anybody's privacy. Mm -hmm. And if there is something, if there is one person or sure. a two people, person or Prashant Kishore or a Rahul Gandhi, I have feeling yes. Yes. that his or her phone is getting tapped. They sh we have a rule of law in this country. We have our judicial system. We have a police. Wherever you have, you can go and file a complaint. On another channel, Mr. M.K. Venu and uh, I was uh, there on the show, the anchor asked him, why don't you go for a judicial mission? Do you believe in the judicial yeah. system and why don't yes. you go for it? He said, yes, we are contemplating that right now we are busy. So you're saying for that, once again, days. so you're saying, once again, because you're saying in a situation where there appears to be a potential breach of national security, it appears that a foreign firm, spyware firm, could have been snooping on Indian citizens, they need to go and file an FIR and pursue it themselves. Government will okay. not do anything. This is uh, uh, Srinivasan. Right now, these are allegations. An allegation by two companies, uh, primarily the, the agencies which are behind this. But Nambia, one is Am Amnesty, Amnesty I'm saying, International. Okay, let's take no, the no, best Amnesty case scenario. These are allegations. They need no, to no, be in proved. 2020. No, no. Let me let me just finish here. Just hold on. Just hold on. It's one thing for the government to say, "Listen, we may not know enough about this. Please go figure it out yourself." 
they're not even doing that they're actually rubbishing the entire investigation there they're saying there's behind. nothing there these are all Can made up allegations foreign powers vested interests i i isn't that dangerous no i, I let me come to that there is a reason for it's a, a person like goal. me to believe no no there is a reason for a person like me to believe there is some kind of a motivated uh, interest in this i'll tell you okay. why one right. is that uh, there is a no, no, there, my my question no, no, is not no, on you me. i'm on i'm just on the on a sovereign no, no, it's a I democratic a, government I'll tell you why in 2000 why would you uh, no, not was, probe please uh, please be fair yaar i mean at least i'm saying that in 2020 amnesty international had to pack up from india They are oh, not no, a great no, covers on. of India. <laughs> no, no, one second. Come second, on, come on. Uh, second, the, the, Mr. The Nambiar, before we get into uh, global conspiracy theories. I may have theories. a hypothesis for you if you want. I, 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 I may have a possible explanation. Why? Okay, all right. Just a second, just a second. Mr. Nambiar, this is, this is not no, some you don't, you don't let me specific probe to target <laughs> India. It's a consortium of journalists, 15 organizations around the world. But uh, sorry, Omar, you wanted to come in. Yes, I have a I have a, I have a potential question. hypothesis to float here so based on what we've reported. Yes, yeah, sorry, go just ahead. Just a small Omar. I want to say one small thing in terms of uh, just a potential hypothesis to answer your question. You keep asking why the government wouldn't probe. I think one possible explanation for this is that your government is the client and as the client of this service, they have very little interest in investigating it at any level. So I think the question needs to be thought about differently. How are it's our very modest contribution to this amazing project that amazing journalists across the world did was to show how the different NSO targets or potential targets kicked into action only after a visit from my prime minister and as you probably know very well our my, our former prime minister Netanyahu and your and then your prime minister Modi have had visits so Modi made his first official visit to Israel in 2017 Netanyahu came to India for the first time in 2018 right. and this is exactly the time frame we see uh, this kicking in and therefore i would suggest that it's within your government's kind of main uh, frame of mind it's actually national security they bought this as a national security right. tool and they're abusing it as such and therefore the kind of national security discourse pr- keeps them safe you know from this kind of okay. political okay can i can i ask okay i to... let me come back to you just a second just to go back to finias so finias uh, you're saying that you stand by this information that you believe it is credible uh, but at the end of the day when the argument is made that out of whatever 40 50000 the dump only a very small percentage actually turned out to have their phones infected uh, which is one of the arguments being used by NSO to discredit the entire effort to that you would say what so i would uh, respond to that by saying first of all uh, more than 50000 is a lot of phone numbers um, even 17 journalists working at the same time can't possibly verify every single one of those numbers in that period of time we were able to as a consortium uh, that, uh, verify many of those numbers hmm. more than 1000 including 300 of those numbers in india and i want to go back to something that omer brought up uh, omer atharats brought up which is um the the i the and this has been reported on by by the guardian among others the 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 time stamps that we're seeing in this data and the time stamps of the pegasus attacks, attacks that we have been able to prove hmm. um are match very closely and this has been also brought up in the in mc international uh, report that's very long and i would recommend everyone who's talking about this in india to read that report because it goes into into great depth about sure about exactly how the forensic analyses were done um and just a, a kind of as a final point there these forensic analyses doing 37 is is actually quite incredible between 2011 and 2021 hmm. only 38 eight, uh journalists were documented having been uh Uh, actually infected by spyware hmm. this 37 in one project and 10 of those were in india okay so that's that's quite a that's quite a large number but ragu karna given the current sort of position the government appears to have taken uh, seems unlikely that we'll see any kind of government effort to to investigate what exactly has happened here i it's just uh, this is an unprecedented situation at least in as long as i've been a journalist in my life Uh, Shane Vasan that we are looking at such major political figures whose phones are not this is not a generic phone tapping situation this is a you know this, this is a form of spyware that Phineas or Omer could probably explain better than me how sophisticated and just how unbelievably intrusive it is it mm. allows people it allows the attacker to do more on a phone than you can do on your own phone 
So the, you know, I mean, there, we, we have various institutions that are supposed to sure. move into action when the government is reneging on its responsibility, which in my mind, it clearly is right now. So, we're, okay. so I'm hoping that we'll see some kind of accountability and some kind of explanation, because I want to just point out one thing, uh, Srinivasan. Uh, a lot of the response to this has been to treat it as though it's normal or as, or as though it's even kind of, uh, mm. uh, it's been a sort of humorous response to this because we, we think of it as just snooping. But just earlier this month, a man died in prison after several months of, an Indian citizen died in prison after several months of suffering because of illegal malware and right. probably because of evidence that was planted on his laptop. Right, Stan Swami you're talking case, about. It's very related uh, to this one. Okay, uh, just... That uh, is the left, that, that's how we need to think about the implications of this kind of, of, this kind okay. of spy. Okay, but when one talks of responsibilities, Omar, I just wanted to ask you, because I think for the rest of the world, now waking up to the very fact that you have a, a firm like the NSO Group, a, a very, very invasive spyware like Pegasus, uh, being produced in Israel, I believe the Israeli government or the defense ministry signs off on, on its use. Uh, is that, how is that being viewed within Israel and, and, is, and what sort of accountability questions is it raising? So I'll say this. I think uh, what, uh, uh, Israel has a long history of using technology and specifically arms and defense and uh, arms exports as a kind of currency for diplomacy. So I think within Israeli society, no one here is surprised. So we know, and in that sense, it's, it's important to note, NSO is not alone. There are many, 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 many companies doing this. It is very possible that within India, there are additional companies providing similar services of different styles right. uh, that can do something similar. So I think Israel has long, or Israelis have long known that, you know, we trade with certain countries for this. Mm. And I think your average Israeli would be very pleased to know that we have good ties with India because of our technology as well. Right. So at that level, I think people, there's a certain tolerance for it. But I think that also people are starting to now realize how bad it is because there's a difference between selling to a country something that they used, you know, to fight terrorism or fight right. pedophilia. And then, you know, to learn that people like the reporters from The Wire, you know what I mean, brave journalists who are doing just amazing work <sighs> are being targeted, you know what I mean? Uh, po politicians where there's just no right. no logic to them being targeted. And in that sense, I think your questions to Phineas are interesting because let's assume that the list is, you know, only, wi only the client's wish list. What does that say about this technology? You know what I mean? If this is how the wish list lo looks, if this is what people want to do with it, right. it almost doesn't matter what actually happened. It just, it's such a, you know, this is technology that the, the Israeli government and defense ministry have to sign off on in a way that's not too dissimilar from actual weapons. You know what I mean? This is treated as a defense export. So, you know, this is like, so if I were to sell you guns and then I were to discover that, you know, within the scope of the gun, you're testing it also, or kind of want to just maybe mm. shoot journalists. The, you know, the fact, the question of whether you shot them or not is almost redundant. It okay. shows what people want to do with this technology. Interesting. We're completely out of time. Pikiri Nambiar, I know you wanted to jump in, but we'll have you back for sure, because this story is not going away. Thank you all so much uh, for joining me on Reality Check. Thank you so much for watching. Good night.